Hi, everyone. I'm Abigail Dalton. Uh, a number of you have received many, many emails from me. So first, I'd like to say thank you for bearing with all of our communications. Uh, I'm the assistant director of the Behavioral Insights Group here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, I'll be one of three MCs uh, for you over the course of these two days, along with our two co-director co-directors of the Behavioral Insights Group, Iris Bonet and Max Bazerman, who is somewhere among you. Uh, welcome to Behavioral Exchange 2016. We are delighted to have you here for the third iteration of this very important annual event. Uh, one of our goals as we've advertised this event and planned it is to provide you with a conference that will feature the newest research, the most pressing questions, and lessons learned from the field of behavioral science and policy. We want to send you away feeling that you've made important connections and can bring your own work and the work of your organizations to the next level. Behavioral science is a booming field, and we want to provide you with the time and space to consider where to go next. We have nearly 400 people here from 26 countries and 175 organizations, so thank you to all of you for traveling so far. And 82 speakers lined up. Uh, it will be a full two days, and we hope that you come away with new collaborators and ideas to use behavioral science to improve society for the public good. Our two days have two themes that will likely overlap. Uh, today you'll hear mostly from academics about new research that we hope you can use in your own work when you leave. Tomorrow we'll hear mostly from those working in government and organizations. A couple of logistical items to note. At any point during the conference, you can tweet at us with the hashtag BX2016. Uh, use this to submit questions during the plenaries, uh, and we'll source from those to get some of our questions and answer sessions started. Books from many of our speakers can be purchased at the Harvard Bookstore Coop, which is to your left as you exit. Um, and exits are at the rear and front of the auditoriums. Right now, I'll ask that you silence your cell phones, please, um, which you can still use to tweet. Uh, and before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you to a few folks, including the Sloan Foundation, for its generous support of this conference and a number of BIGS activities, uh, the Behavioral Insights team, and Jay Powell for their work organizing much of this event. And for a lot of the speakers who are here today, they've done a lot of work putting together these plenaries and these breakouts. Uh, we'll start with the conference with two sessions in here, one immediately after the other, and then we'll move to the break. Uh, and that said, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Iris Bonet. Iris is the Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Director of its Women in Public Policy Program. She is also the Co-Chair of the Behavioral Insights Group and the Faculty Chair of the Executive Program, Global Leadership and Public Policy for the 21st Century for the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leaders. Her most, research uh, her most recent research examines gender equality nudges, interventions that level the playing field in organizations, politics, and society, also the topic of her new excellent book, What Works? Gender Equality by Design, which you can purchase in the coop. And with that, thank you, Eric. Thank you so much for this uh, very kind introduction, Abby. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you. And in fact, before I do anything else, let's give a big round of applause to Abby, because Abby. Abby is the intellectual, the spiritual, and the logistical mastermind <laughs> behind this conference. So thank you very much, Abby. Thank you to your team, and thank you to all the volunteers who are here with us today. So um, thanks for coming. We uh, are setting out with a discussion on diversity for two reasons. The first one is that we do believe that Behavioral Insights has lots of promise for helping us move the needle on creating more diversity and more inclusion in our organizations and really in society around the world. And the second reason is that we have it at the beginning because we believe that we as a community of behavioral scientists should also take diversity quite seriously and become role models in terms of diversity and inclusion. And that's why we're so excited that so many people from so, different, so many different walks of life from different countries, academia, practice, genders, races, ethnicities are here. So thank you all for coming. I am going to introduce the panelists in just a moment. And then we each will speak for about five minutes or so. And then we're happy to have a conversation with all of you. And for those who are following us on Twitter and can tweet their questions um, to Phil here, who is going to field them to us here up on the panel. So our field, uh, diversity and inclusion, may be quite symptomatic for many of the fields that you are part of. 
And that is that um, actually quite some time ago, 50 years, 40 years ago, even longer in some cases, the civil rights movement, Title IX in this country, and similar types of initiatives in other countries. I'm happy to say that my home country introduced uh, the right to vote for women already in 1971. Um, so in any case, it's, it took uh, some uh, a bit longer, um, but many have been on this journey for quite a bit. And that journey included mainly two things. One is, of course, laws. And the second one was lots of training programs. They included diversity training programs, and corporate America estimates run that corporate America spends about $8 billion a year on diversity training programs. They also included leadership training programs for the traditionally disadvantaged. And they included negotiation training, leadership training, but also some, in some more elaborate forms, mentorship programs, sponsorship programs, networking initiatives, and that's really been what the field has been doing in the last, I'd say, 30 to 40 years. And then those of us here on the panel um, have actually, in different ways, taken a look at the evidence of whether these initiatives have been working. I think the summary of that evidence is twofold. And none of this will surprise you because in your respective fields in health or financial literacy or what it might have been, you've probably come to similar conclusions. So the first takeaway was, we're not measuring. So we're spending $8 billion a year on our corporate diversity training programs, but we don't measure. We just throw money at the problem. We have no clue whether anything is happening. And the second piece is that in the very few cases where we do measure, which is mostly correlational analyses, but the very, very few handful of studies that actually have done randomized controlled trials on diversity trainings, they have found that they basically don't work. Something similar, although less dramatic, can be said about leadership training programs. It's a bit less dramatic because many leadership programs have actually tried to bring some of the behavioral insights that you will hear about today kind of to their trainings and try to really build capacity for traditionally disadvantaged groups to perform more effectively and to level the playing field. But so those of us here, and I'm sure many of you in the room, think that behavioral insights has something to contribute to this dialogue that we might not have fully exploited so far, which goes beyond training, which goes beyond fixing traditional disadvantaged people, and goes beyond fixing our mindsets. Because again, behavioral science for many years has been trying to fix mindsets, and I would say with so-so success. Some of us would actually say we've actually not done quite so well. Some of these biases are pretty stubborn and are just kind of with us um, uh, as human beings. <coughs> so what we want to do on the panel is kind of talk a bit about, so what kind of interventions could in fact de-bias the systems could de-bias how we do things, our practices and procedures, rather than de-biasing mindsets or fixing the traditional disadvantaged groups. And with that, I'm happy to introduce my co-panelists here. To my left, we have uh, Linda Babcock. She joins us from Carnegie Mellon University. Most or all of you know her work well. She has been one of the pioneers really bringing the question of gender into negotiations, thinking about whether men and women not only negotiate differently, but why they do that, and if so, whether anything should or could be done about this. Linda has written a super important book for the field and for the world entitled Women Don't Ask, which of course already kind of asks the question of why do women not ask and if they don't, should we just accept or should we do something about this? Then we have Evan Applebaum here. He joins us from MIT. And Evan's work uh, really has pushed the boundaries on debiasing mindsets, thinking about, so what's next? What more can we do in changing our teams and helping our teams perform better? Uh, I've been particularly impressed by his work on race. And it certainly resonated with me and some of his findings telling us how difficult it is for us to talk about race and how we're trying to avoid 
it by all means. And so Evan is going to talk to us a bit more about the intersection of gender and race and what kind of interventions might work to level the playing field for different traditionally disadvantaged groups. And then Kathy Phillips joins us from Columbia University. And Kathy, of course, has been one of the pioneers in the field thinking about diversity in teams. And while I had known Kathy's work for a long time, she and I uh, got to know each other at a conference that we organized here through the Women in Public Policy program at the Kennedy School on the business case for gender diversity. Uh, really kind of unpacking, is there a business case? When is there a business case, et cetera? And uh, I was struck at the time by Kathy's research showing that yes, there might actually be a business case, but more importantly, we collectively as a community hadn't spent enough time talking about how difficult it is to make diversity work. And I think that's, in particular for behavioral scientists, a very, very important insight that in order to move the needle, we have to meet people where they really are and kind of think about kind of what keeps them back. And so with that, let me offer a kind of few remarks on our own work. I've talked about some of this at last year's BX, and even in Sydney, I've already talked about um, some of this work because I've been on a journey now writing this book, What Works, trying to understand what works and what doesn't work in terms of leveling the playing field for men and women. And some of our work has in particular been focused on evaluation procedures. That's joint work with Max Spazerman, who is here as well, my co-chair of the Behavioral Insights Group here at Harvard, and Alexander van Geen from uh, the Netherlands, from the Rotterdam University, is also here, where we really try to understand how can we make it easier for people who have to evaluate others for jobs, for promotions, for job assignments, how we can make it easier for us to get it right. And one of the insights that we came up with was that comparative evaluation can be really helpful. And what we mean with that is that one of the basic insights in behavioral science is that we tend to evaluate comparatively, whether that's a drink or whether that's a temperature in this room or whether that is, in fact, another person. That we want to have a reference point to put things into perspective. And if I don't give you a reference point, you will rely on the reference point that's available in your mind, and that is the stereotype. And what we could show is that if we actually confront people with more than one candidate, whether that is for a job or for promotion, but if we actually confront people with more than one candidate, then they don't have to rely on this internal reference, this internal reference person, to calibrate their judgment. But there's more, more insights um, that we have kind of discussed. And maybe rather than repeating what I've shared with you last uh, September at the Great Conference in London, let me maybe leave you with three insights that I've now kind of came across uh, through my book tour. The first one is that I think we collectively can benefit tremendously from working with technology. Something that has completely surprised me are the new startups now who are taking the insights developed in this room and translate them into technology, making it easier for people to do the right thing. So in my own field, in terms of diversity and inclusion, there are now about 20 startups that I'm aware of, which work on everything from de-biasing job advertisements to de-biasing evaluation procedures, for example, to helping companies evaluate job applicants blindly two including um, the wisdom of the crowd, something that applied. One of our very own um, uh, startups in the behavioral insights team in London uh, has been developing. So, so that's very exciting. And I'm putting this out there because I'm sure in your fields, whether this is financial literacy or health or education uh, or poverty allevi alleviation, it, that's just quite exciting that many of our insights actually lend themselves to translation into something that then can help others do the right thing more easily. The second takeaway that I thought I would share with you, which might also be generally interesting to you, is we always wonder what space behavioral insights is made for. Right? Because there's other interventions that we could think about. There's other instruments at our disposal, such as laws or incentives or rules. And the UK, I think, has um, played a very important role through its behavioral insights team, but also 
uh, in my field now again, through its use of behavioral insights to increase gender diversity on corporate boards. And what I learned from that example was not just that it was amazing that they were able to increase gender diversity on corporate sports to 25% by the end of last year without quotas or any other um, rules or incentives, but just by relying on a coalition and nudges, but also that this is the kind of a space where, which really asks for people like us. The space where we have little power over, and therefore, kind of what we have at our disposal are nudges. And I've come across this again when I gave a talk at the OECD um, and met with the leadership of the OECD, and they told me that they got the G20 last year in Brisbane to sign an agreement that they would decrease the gender gap in workforce participation by 25% by 2025. And interestingly enough, of course, that particular example has many of the same characteristics as increasing gender diversity in corporate boards. Because the OECD has no power over the G20, has no power over these 20 countries, but now really has to enable them to nudge them along to actually live up to their promise. So that's a project that the Women in Public Policy Program is going to be working on, which came about maybe more of a surprise to me than um, anything planned. But again, what I want to leave with you is thinking about the spaces which are super hungry for behavioral insights might be relevant for your fields as well. And then finally, and I'll end with that, um, another thing I, I learned, which of course is not rocket science, and sh we should be the first ones to realize this, is we have to make it super easy, 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 easy for people to adopt. Now again, many of you have worked on that, um, but it's been surprising to me how much it takes after writing a book or how much it takes after having told people and shared insights and to really kind of climb this last mountain, this last mile um, that we all, of course, as behavioral scientists know, we need to climb and help organizations to do that. And so I just would like to suggest to all of you to think hard about how you can build that bridge more effectively. And of course, that's the topic of tomorrow. We're starting with this a bit today, but the topic of tomorrow of how we can build the bridge between academics and decision makers across sectors even more effectively. And I want to um, end by give, showing you a short video clip that we um, created um, on my book on what works. Um, and I'm showing, you, I'm showing you the video clip because I, it's a good introduction for our panel but also because I think it's been one effective tool for us to communicate with the world. So sadly enough, the video now has been watched by more than 200,000 people. I can't say my book has been bought by that many people, but um, in any case, it speaks to the general idea that we have to make this easy for people to understand. So with that, if we could show the video, and then I'll turn to Lynn. Let's face it, you're biased, but don't get defensive. We're built to be biased. Does your brain think these squares are different shades of gray? Think again. Your brain took this shadow into account and made assumptions that this square was darker based on the checkerboard pattern. This natural tendency gives us shortcuts to make sense of our world. The trouble is, these shortcuts, when applied to people, can result in bias. So, how do we avoid unconscious bias to build a better society? Behavioral design offers a new solution to collapse gender inequality in our lifetime. What if we could make it easier for our biased minds to get things right by changing our organizations? For example, in the 1970s, major U.S. orchestras made an ingenious discovery. Adding a simple curtain to the audition process allowed them to listen to the music rather than judge musicians based on their looks. Not only did they acquire better talent, but the fraction of female musicians grew by more than 30 percentage points. Simple solutions like this can also debias our workplace. Simply removing the names on resumes gets a lot of the bias out of the way and allows access to the full talent pool of candidates. And here's some low-hanging fruit. Research has shown comparing candidates to each other rather than the imaginary stereotypical applicant calibrates our minds to the best rather than those who we think look the part. Behavioral designs like these have doubled the fraction of women on the boards of the UK's largest companies in a very short amount of time. Seeing women in leadership, whether in business or politics, 
changes what people think is possible for their daughters and themselves. In 1993, India mandated one-third of seats be reserved for women to serve as elected leaders at the local level. This not only offered new insights into public policy, but also encouraged women to speak up in community meetings. And seeing women work made it more likely for girls in the community to stay in school, marry later, and delay having their first child. Kind of gives weight to the phrase, seeing is believing. Many organizations, including Harvard, have taken this to heart by hanging up more portraits of female role models. Here's what you can do today. Try changing who we look up to on our walls. So yes, it's time to face it. We're biased, but we can design around it. We have the research and tools to cheaply and quickly redesign how we work, learn, and live. It's not only the right thing, it's the smart thing to do. And now it's up to you. And with that, I'm... I'm going to turn over to Linda. Hi, good morning. So for the, fa for the past 15 years, my research has focused on gender differences in the propensity to negotiate. And what we have found is that women are much, much less likely to negotiate uh, than men. And this obviously has consequences for gender inequality and helps to reinforce factors like the gender wage gap and the glass ceiling. So how should we solve this problem of the differences in the propensity to negotiate? Should we just encourage women to go out there and haggle? Well, the answer actually isn't that simple because our society has a double standard in how it perceives behavior in women versus the same behavior in men. And my research with Hannah Bowles has shown that women can face significant backlash when they do negotiate. And this backlash can have very severe consequences for a woman's career. So this topic of women in negotiation got a lot of publicity um, back in October 2014. And that's when, um, infamously, the Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella, uh, at the Grace Hopper Women in Tech Conference um, made some very interesting uh, remarks. Uh, he gave a talk, and after the talk, he, there was a Q&A, and he was asked to offer advice to women who might feel uncomfortable negotiating. And this is what he says, and I'm going to read it because it's a direct quote. It's not really about asking for a raise, but knowing and having faith that the system will give you the right raise. And then, just to make things worse, he added, that might be one of the initial superpowers that, quite frankly, women who don't ask have. I actually didn't know that all these years I've been studying superpowers, so it's uh, uh, good to know. Uh, as you can imagine, this set off a firestorm in the media. And of course, these comments that he made were quite um, unfortunate and very distressing. But it actually had a positive effect in that it set off a series of discussion in the media and, and in companies about what could we do about the gender wage gap. And what was interesting is that many companies, especially in technology, were quick to introduce policies and procedures that they felt in their companies might address the wage gap. And so I'm going to talk about a few of those and talk about their likely uh, success. All right, so the first one is no negotiation policies. And Reddit is one of the companies that initiated this. So they said, Thou shalt not negotiate in the company anymore. Now, as with most policies, the devil is in the details. And how this is going to affect the wage gap remains to be seen in terms of how they actually implement the policy. Think about if the policy wasn't strictly enforced. What do we think would happen? Well, men would test the policy, and they would negotiate. And if People want to reward this behavior because a, maybe a man negotiates, he's had great performance. They might actually um, uh, um, reward him for doing that negotiation. So they might not strictly follow the policy. But women are more likely to obey the rules. They said not to negotiate, so I'm not going to negotiate. So this policy, if it's not strictly enforced, could actually exacerbate the gender wage gap by having men negotiate and women not negotiating. And so they have to really think about how this policy is going to be uh, implemented. What about paid transparency? Uh, companies like Buffer and Sumall have decided to make their wages public. Well, this could have two effects. 
First of all, the idea behind tra tra pay transparency is that people would learn if they weren't being paid the appropriate amount and then they would negotiate. But what about the backlash? It doesn't solve this problem. We can't put women in a no-win no situation because if they find out they're not pay being paid as much as their male colleagues, they negotiate, they could get this backlash. The second problem with this is that pay transparency actually makes people feel terrible. And there's a really nice study by David Card uh, and his colleagues that looked at the University of California. University of California actually has a website where all employees have their pay on the website, so it's public information. But most people who work for UC don't know this. So what they did is an experiment in which they either told people about the website or they didn't tell people about the website. And then they followed up to ask questions about job satisfaction and intention to leave. And what they found was that for people who were below the median salary in their group, the effect of information made people less satisfied with their job because they went out, they looked at the website, they found they were being paid below average, and they were unhappy. What about people above the median? Did people feel happy when they learned this information? No, because of course you're above the median, of course I deserved it, then um, it doesn't actually, information doesn't actually increase satisfaction. So it can make a bunch of people really unhappy. So this policy also has some problems. Uh, there's one more I want to talk about, and that is, uh, this is introduced by Laszlo Block, who's the Vice President of People Operations at Google. And what they did is stop asking about salary history. And this can stop past discrimination, because if women are coming into organizations with lower pay and they're asking about salary history, this can perpetuate the wage gap. So I think this is a nice one to stop uh, uh, discrimination in its tracks. The last thing, since we're in Boston, we should talk about the Boston Initiative. And last year, the mayor of Boston announced that they wanted to make Boston the first city to close the wage gap. So they introduced a program, um, and I think it has really three components that will make it successful. One is they decided they're going to train 85,000 women in the city of Boston to negotiate. Secondly, they've gotten companies to sign pledges to try to eliminate the gender pay gap in their organizations and to submit salary data uh, to be published in a, in a report. And so this can focus on the problem because if, it, if we don't measure it, it doesn't matter. And so now many companies are gonna be measuring it and are pledging to try to help um, eliminate the gap. And the third thing I think that, that why this, this initiative may be successful, and I think this actually might be the most important one, is it is, it is a public pronouncement that we want to have women negotiating. Because that is the only way that we're gonna change norms around negotiating. The city of Boston says, yes, we're training women, we want companies to close the pay gap, we want their to, women to be negotiating in these companies. And it's that changing of social norms that could really solve the problem in the long run. I really like this initiative because it is an, a great example of the public sector, educational institutions, and businesses working together, because it's gonna take all of us if we really wanna solve this problem. Thanks. We're now switching from kind of fixing women or enabling women to succeed to diversity in teams and how to make that work. Kathy. Beautiful. Um, I actually have a few slides that aren't up yet. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kathy Phillips, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the research I've been doing over the past 20 years or so. Once people get into the organization, they've been hired, they've negotiated their salaries, they actually have to work with the other people that are there. <laughs> oh, I think I clicked, clicked, clicked. There we go. They, have to ha they actually have to work with the other people that are there. So my research has focused on uh, what happens when people actually come into the organization and participate in teamwork, which most people do. When I first started teaching, I used to ask people to raise their hand if they worked in a team. And you know, 50% went up, and now I have to ask if they work in four teams, because it's just um, so um, pervasive throughout our organizations. This is a piece that I published in Scientific American, How Diversity Makes Us Smarter. And it's based on um, not correlational, but causational research that I've done and that others have done over the years that have really tried to understand what happens when people get into a team setting. So imagine the following. You come into a group, you're trying to make a decision about what's the right thing to do. You have four options, you have to decide on that. The four of you come into the room and you start talking. I videotape your conversation and I try to figure out who's saying what to who 
and if you get the right answer. I've done this with hundreds of groups now, and this is what I get consistently. The percentage of groups that are accurate is always better in diverse groups than in homogeneous ones. That is, a higher percentage of diverse groups get the right answer than homogeneous groups. The homogeneous groups are doing all right. It's not, not bad, but the diverse groups are outperforming them. But what really makes the research distinctive is that I ask them questions afterwards, like, how well did you do? How did it go? How confident are you that you have the right answer? And you see time and time again the opposite that the homogeneous groups believe that they were more effective and they're more confident in the decisions that they have made, even when they're wrong. So if you look deeper into the data, you see that actually diverse groups, their, their confidence kind of moves with, the, with their performance. The homogeneous groups, doesn't matter if they got it right or wrong, they're equally confident, right? <laughs> they're equally confident. Now, as I've dug into this research, there's a couple of insights that I've learned about the real value of diversity and where it comes from. Oftentimes people will say, individuals who look different will bring different perspectives to the table and that's where the value of diversity comes from. So when I come into the room and when I join the organization, I'm supposed to bring a, about 100 million to the bottom line just because I just joined. But that doesn't make any sense, really. That's a lot of weight to put on the shoulders of people that you're bringing into the organization to diversify the place. So when you think about this, there's a few things that I've learned about social category diversity. When people see differences on the surface, there's a few things that happen. First of all, it legitimates the expression of different perspectives. So even when people who look the same have different perspectives, they don't come out until there's a trigger. There's an expectation raised that maybe we have some different perspectives here. It's easy to understand it when you think about somebody in finance versus somebody in marketing. Of course they're going to have different perspectives. But we use that same assumption over and over again for all kinds of differences, surface level differences that really are not necessarily a predictor of what we know. Okay? It enhances pre-meeting preparation, information sharing, integrative complexity, that is how deeply you think about the problem that you're looking at. It increases perspective taking, creativity, and just downright effort. People work harder in diverse environments than they do in homogeneous ones. You're paying those people all day long. When I pay people, I want them to work. Diversity increases people's likelihood of focusing on what they're doing. But we also know that people are lazy. They're cognitive misers. They don't want to work so hard. Okay? And this is a problem. It doesn't feel as good to people. They may not be satisfied during the process. So there's a few things that I've tried to think about, and one is this analogy. Working hard. Imagine going to the gym and standing in the gym. Are you going to build muscles if you're just standing there? No, you won't. I guarantee you. I put my running clothes on sometimes in the morning and walk my kids to school. <laughs> that is not a workout, people. <laughs> that is not a workout. You actually have to work hard, and the twinge that you feel in your muscles, the pain that you feel, that's a sign that something's working right. It's the same thing with diversity. That discomfort that you feel, that questioning of yourself, that conflict that you have, that friction that is created, that is the same as that friction in the muscles that will get you something better. So we have to try to convince people that they need to embrace that friction, that pain, because it's going to lead to something better. Clear expectations. We need to stop talking about the business case for diversity and just thinking about it as a bottom line issue because I don't think I've made any of the institutions I've joined millions of more dollars at, on the bottom line. I think I've made them better, but I think I've made them better because of the work that I've done with all the other people around me. Second thing, team process. It turns out that we know a lot about teams. We know a lot about how to work well in teams. There's some good practices that we know work well. We are biased against diversity. We're biased against diversity. When we see diverse teams, we actually, we actually think that they are too conflictual. It's a problem. We don't like it. And so you have to think about what can you do in the team to make sure that the team is embracing the friction that they have. So here's a list of good practices that we've known from team research for a long time that we tend not to put into place. Okay, so I'm going to leave you with that because my time is up. I have to pass the mic. Thank you very much.
Good morning. Everybody hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Iris and Max, wherever Max is, for having me and for coming this morning. I'm going to talk to you about what I believe to be really one of the most fundamental tensions in contemporary uh, diversity research and practice today. And it is this sort of question. Oh, I don't need to. I'm not going to go in slides yet. You can look at this, though. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, this tension of what we should tell people to do about the fact that others will be different than them in terms of race, in terms of gender. So as you see in the theme that's been running in a thread through uh, Iris's talk and video and what Kathy and Linda have talked about, should we be telling people uh, to take gender into account when we're making decisions or should they be blind? Is race something that we should be talking about when we're interacting with people from different backgrounds or should we not talk about that? When we're trying to craft broader organizational cultures that help stigmatized groups succeed and persist, should we be crafting cultures around the business case for differences, for decisions, for cultures, uh, for uh, creating uh, some bottom line outcome? Or instead, should we be talking about a commitment to shared values, fairness, equality, uh, and sort of being unified by the fact that everyone deserves to be here? There is a really distinct, a palpable tension between these two types of messages. And really to date, where the literature is, it's been asking for many, many years now, which is best, right? Which one is going to be the silver bullet? And so uh, the one message uh, that I'd like to leave with you uh, for, for right now is uh, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. And I think that we've been asking the question uh, sort of the wrong way. It's an oversimplification to think that just focusing on differences or looking beyond them is going to be this panacea that will create more equity, that will make interactions go more smoothly. Instead, we need to be thinking about, so what are the key factors within organizations, within societies, between people and interactions that determine whether one is better than another? So let me give you an example of one of the factors uh, that we've sort of to looked at. So for example, let's take an organizational context. Uh, we've done a, a, a number of work now looking at numerical representation. So the question is, in organizations, they try to craft these cultures that can either focus on differences or equality irrespective of these differences. And it turns out which groups are being targeted by these messages and their numerical representation in the organization matter tremendously. So, for example, white women and racial minorities are two of the groups most frequently targeted by diversity efforts in organizations. And while both these groups are typically represented in smaller numbers than white men, in many workplaces white women are between 30 to 40 percent of employees, and African Americans, for example, are 5 percent or less. So what we find is that what it means, the implications of shining a spotlight on differences have very different implications when you're 5% versus 40% of an organization. So for example, we have field evidence across 151 big law firms that shows that those firms who t enlist a diversity approach where they're focusing on the benefits of differences for decisions uh, for improving a culture, white women are significantly less likely to turn over from those uh, firms, and when we present white women with these messages in controlled experiments, they're more likely to be engaged, they're more likely to perform on difficult tasks. However, African Americans show sort of the reverse pattern. In the same set of firms, African Americans are less likely to turn over or leave these firms when the firms are focusing on fairness and merit and people deserving to be there in spite of differences. And we find the same patterns in, again, in experiments. And sort of a key experiment that I'll just, uh, a key study in this package that I'll just relate to you now is that when we tell African American experiments in the lab to envision being 40% of an organization, they look just like white women. They respond better to this difference approach as opposed to say, let's look beyond differences. This is critical to understanding how the structure and the, the context within, within which these seemingly, uh, these stigmatized groups that are often bucketed in as one and the same can drastically shape what it means to focus on differences versus not. 
Focusing on differences can both be enlifting, energizing, it can be something that gives people the recognition uh, and uh, sense of making a case for why they're there and why it's important for the organization, but it can also be feeding the very concerns of people who are qualified would least like to hear, sort of opening up ammunition to question why, for example, uh, a person of color is there in the first place. Was it sort of an affirmative action hire? Or was this some uh, lowered standard that brought them into the organization? So these equally well-intentioned approaches really depend on these other factors. And just to give you a feel for the broader theory of other types of conditions we're, we're finding here, it's typically when things are bad, we find that this genuine focus on equality and fairness works better. So when groups are in very low numbers, when perceptions of uh, just that, that discrimination is intentional are very high, when trust is very low, those are the situations in which sort of this foundational uh, focus on uh, equality, irrespective of differences, seems to be more effective. And as situations improve, right? Sorry, can you hear me now? Uh, as situations improve, when numbers increase, when trust is restored, uh, when uh, treatment improves, that's when this sort of focus on differences, why differences are important, and how this helps us sort of create a sort of a culture and environment in which everyone has a equal chance to thrive in the organization, that's when it becomes important. So I think where the research is going, again, is not which is best, but when is one better than the other, and how can we sort of sequence those efforts over time to sort of create uh, more equitable uh, climates. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, we're happy to take questions, comments, thoughts. We have mics here, so you should use the mic, even though you might think you have a loud voice, but uh, still do use the mic. Uh, we're also happy to take questions from Twitter. And do we have one already? We do. Perfect. Why don't we start with that one? Uh, our first question from Twitter, uh, Rafael Batista asked, our internal references make sense to us, and stereotypes are very difficult to break. So how do we rewrite the narratives in our minds? I'm ha Kathy, I'm ha you, why ahead. don't you go first and then? Uh, I was just going to say, um, yes, you're right. Stereotypes are very powerful. Uh, you have to uh, push against them. You have to expose yourself to counter stereotypical information often. Um, there is research by Robert Livingston that has looked at how, um, how much bias do we have in our society in terms of, kind of both unconsciously and explicitly. It's a very, very small percentage of us who are not biased, very tiny small percentage. And the research that he did show that part of it is that peop those people are resistant to making connections between two things, a, a good thing and, and a bad thing, right? So if you expose someone to all of this negative information about something over and over and over again, most of us are going to have a very hard time ignoring that. So you have to then counter that by exposing people to positive things, uh, associations, right? So, you, so it's a long journey. I think you have to constantly be working at it, questioning yourself, and asking other people to question you. So, I mean, I completely agree with everything Kathy said, but um, I'm going to go back to something that we had in the film that seeing really is believing, which mm -hmm. is exactly what you just mm -hmm. said. And as long as we don't see male kindergarten teachers or female CEOs, we don't naturally associate those jobs with men or women, respectively. Mm -hmm. And so these stereotypes are well and alive. Uh, the, I have been quite struck by the research in India by Esther de Flo and Rohini Pandey and others looking at role models. India, some of you might know, is one of the first countries to introduce quotas, which are not nudges, but they introduce quotas uh, for uh, village heads at the local level. And they literally took a third of these villages and said that these villages had to have a female leader. And so a number of researchers now this was introduced in 1993, and so this is the longest running experiment. So A, it's a natural experiment, B, it's long running. That gives us some insight on what the impact of quotas is. And what they found, many things, but related to your question was that in villages that had been exposed to two females in those now 22 years, mindsets are starting to change, and people are starting to associate political leadership with women, 
with one of the most recent papers that was just published in Science showing that a core career aspiration of parents now is for their daughters to become politicians. Which of course, you know, there are not that many slots, but it's of course a behavioral response again to the kind of availability bias that now there are some of these jobs available for women newly um, and they're very salient. So I think seeing is believing is really important. But I'm going to end by saying, for me personally, the even more important message is to take the minds the way they are. I think changing minds is not impossible, but going to take a long, long time. So I think it's much better to create a world in which we can do the right thing with the minds that we've got. And that means devising systems and not devising mindset. Yes, please. Could we have a mic back here? Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vera Ferreira from Brazil. And uh, I'd like to hear if you have, if you have any instances of uh, very carefully thought over and designed strategies that did not work. Because we can learn a lot from failure. Like something that you know you thought for sure it was going to be okay, and then it didn't. Thank you. Uh, so Evan Applebaum and I have some research that hasn't been published. But one of the logics, mm -hmm. one of the logics behind the research was perhaps if we tell diverse groups that they have performed well, mm -hmm. that they will then be happy, accept that, you know, move forward with that information. And one of the things we found, which actually did work in these studies, was that when we, we had people go through multiple trials uh, of performance, teams go through multiple trials of performance, and we gave them feedback after each trial. And then we, we asked them to predict how well they would do on the next trial. Okay, so one of the things we found was that homogeneous groups, when you gave them this information that they did well, they completely took that information in and said, of course we're going to do well on the next round. But when you told diverse groups that they had done well or bad, right, whatever information you gave them, they just didn't accept it as predictive of the next round of behavior, of the next round of performance. And, and it, was, it was interesting because on the one hand, uh, if you think about what is a bias, it turns out that the homogeneous groups may have actually been a little more biased because there was no reason why performance on round one should actually predict performance on round two. But the homogeneous groups both accepted that positive feedback and they actually didn't like it when they got negative feedback. They thought they would do, do poorly on the next round as well. So there's, um, they didn't work. It didn't, we, we were hoping that maybe if we told the diverse groups that they did well, that that would you know, help propel them, make them more confident, et cetera, and it just didn't. It just didn't. So it's not, it's not about kind of just telling people, giving people feedback, that, giving teams feedback. That doesn't seem to do it, at least not in those three rounds that we had in that study. It's one example. Linda. I also have a study that was also unpublished um, <laughs> with Hannah Bowles. And uh, after we did the research on the backlash against female negotiators, we were just so sad about it. Um, and so we wanted to try to create a situation in which this didn't happen. And it turns out it's pretty hard. Um, one of the ideas that we had was to say, um, this was in the context of hiring somebody, and you saw them negotiate, and this is when people didn't want to hire the woman who negotiated, but they were perfectly happy to hire the man that negotiated. That negotiated. We said, okay, let's change the, the kind of scenario this is. Let's have this be a company in which the culture is dog eat dog, you eat what you kill, we want people really aggressive in this company. We thought, like, this is going to do it. This is going to reduce backlash. And it didn't. It turns out this is a really thorny problem. Uh, well, I, I, I'm happy to add a study that is not published. As well. <laughs> <laughs> if that's, so I'm happy to also take more questions. But uh, just very quickly, so we try to, to replicate the norms, kind of uh, descriptive norms turn into prescriptive norms in the gender diversity space. We haven't actually submitted the paper yet, so maybe who knows. But in any case, it didn't work. So we couldn't tell people, here's what others have done. They've hired more women than men in counter-stereotypical tasks, or vice versa. Um, it didn't motivate others to just copy, um, just copy what previous people have done. But in fact, what we did find was something super surprising for me. Um, in particular, the men, we only found it on the men. The men tried to correct for the wrong choices of previous groups where they hired, for example, more women. Um, I don't think the last word is spoken on that question, uh, but I do think that whole question of norms and how can we change norms and change, uh, for example, the composition of groups is a hugely interesting one and 
so many of you have done important work on descriptive and then turning into prescriptive norms that I think we collectively um, can benefit a lot from learning from each other in that domain. I think there's a question uh, right back there, second to last row, and then going to go to this side of the room. Yeah, let me go back there. Hi. I'd like to find out whether or not uh, when an organization uh, or political organization or economic organization takes on a female leader, how do the men in the organization or the females in the organization respond? Is there some behavioral change to people who are there? And I ask this in the broader context of the idea that, uh, of some of the things I read, the idea that uh, men feel very disempowered and you get into a kind of a negative spiral. You know, they see so many girls, you know, going up to the, to doing better than them in education. Or is there, is there some kind of research done to, to those, address those things? Um, and I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking at others. Uh, so, so generally, I would say, although I just talked about our research where we found an effect on men in particular, I think generally most of us would say that the differences between the observers are actually smaller than the differences in what we see. So what I mean with that is both men and women respond negatively to male kindergarten teachers or to female CEOs. And sometimes we find a bit something going on in the demographic characteristics of the observers, but the big action is really in what we see. So that would be my kind of overarching comment. I don't know whether anyone else has any, anything more specific. I mean, you're, you're saying, is there a particular dynamic between female CEOs, female leaders, and so to speak, male followers? Um, so, I don't know. So there's, there's a, um, a reference I'll give you, but I, I don't want to repeat the research because my memory is not serving me completely well. But Victoria Breskel uh. has research that I think is quite relevant to the question that you have just asked. Um, does anybody in the room actually know it? Yeah, I mean she Victoria Bresco. Mm -hmm. I think look look her up for sure. Yeah. And, yes, yeah. so she, I mean she looked at you know what is um, super interesting work also on backlash related to Linda's work, um, but but also I think mean, it showed that uh, power is something very different for men and for women, and that for example, uh, equal speaking times will be perceived as women speaking too much for women. And for men who say the same amount, the same thing, it will be perceived as, wow, he's really showing his expertise and competence here. Um, but I think even her research is even stronger saying it's what we observe. But she might also have a, you know, gender differences on the observer. But super interesting work, yeah. I think we have a question right here, and then we'll go back. I think I had a question in the third back row. Hi, Shirley Phil from Australia. Um, it's interesting because I've heard you speak a couple of times and I think um, from the conference that we had in Australia there's been some action taken, particularly in the Australian Bureau of Statistics and they had some issues and I think that you know that they started it with a policy that we wanted to ensure that we had more females in the senior executive service. So there was a whole lot of work around talking about how we're going to get extras and unsuccessful failure couldn't get more people. And then they looked at the structural blockers that were happening because all of the senior executive positions were in Canberra and they had really bright female people that were uh, actually out in the various states. So it's like you have to go to Washington to work if you're the American alternative. So they went, well, why can't we have these positions out within the various states? And when they changed that structural blocker, that increased the number of people that actually then applied and more likely. But just before we left Australia, there was a big announcement. They actually ran the blind um, uh, recruitment process and they had in the general recruitment 60-40% uh, recruitment in females and at the senior executive service, I think it was 13 or 14 out of 18 senior executive service people were actually recruited as females. So they've had been on a very long journey. So I thought just to share that, which I knew some of you know about it, um, with a broader group, because that came from very fantastic leadership, but working then on the behavioural insight stuff that we learnt from some of yourselves. Great. Thank you very much. I mean, I think Australia, like I mean, some other countries, the UK, Singapore, have really taken this on, kind of behavioural insights, and also, I mean, brought it into the diversity space. And I think it's super, super exciting that you're actually doing the work and running some experiments on them as well. I think, uh, ah, we have it here, and then I had another hand, yeah, Henriette. Yeah. 
Hi, good morning. I wanted to ask about this idea of blinding or stripping off identifying information from resumes and applications. As we all know, we live in a society that is profoundly structured by racial hierarchy and other forms of inequality. If you take the names off of resumes, that's not going to change the fact that people grow up in different neighborhoods and go to different schools. Some people can afford unpaid internships and others can't. And so my question is, does taking names off resume make it seem like we've achieved a perfectly meritocratic system when we in fact are really, really far from equality? And in general, I'm curious what the panel thinks about going for sort of the low hanging fruit and the quick fixes. Is there ever a trade off between that and going for more transformative structural changes? Thanks. Yeah, so I have something to say about it. So it's a great question. And I think that um, you have to chunk out the different processes by which somebody may enter an organization. So if you're concerned about judgmental bias creeping into uh, the evaluation process of resumes, you can think of blinding resumes as one tool you have. But as you suggest, the person gets hired, uh, that strategy is not going to work anymore when they get to the office, right? So uh, race, gender is going to be obvious from the moment individuals work in. And so then I think, as you say, you know, we found in research, you can't uh, feign ignorance and pretend that you don't see race or pretend that you don't see gender. And so that's why it becomes really, really important to have organizations take the opportunity to really carefully craft their vision about diversity. They have an opportunity to create a framework for people to think about what diversity is, here's how you should be acting with people from different groups, here's why it's important to us, and here's the reason why we have a, a, a diverse pool of employees. So that's a, that can be a void where they don't say anything and people impute their own uh, assumptions about why people are there, but I think there's a tremendous opportunity to really carefully think about that vision and that framework, and, and it's okay to have pieces that are blind and pieces that are not. If you think about this as a, a, a broader process that is chunked out, it's difficult to think about uh, only using one type of approach throughout. Yes, please. And I just want to reiterate one point, and that is that this is going to take a long time. So our provost in the past year assembled a diversity committee, and we looked at faculty hiring this year. And based upon a lot of the things that we've all talked about, we implemented a series of changes in the way we're doing hiring and screening and interviewing. And he said something at, at one of the last meetings. He said, oh, I'm really looking forward to making big changes next year and seeing some good results. And I said, no. <laughs> if we work really hard for 20 years, really hard every year, then I think we'll see some progress. And we really have to push against this, well, here's one fix that we can do, and then everything's going to be fine, and may give then license for bias to enter in in other ways in the system. We have to really see the different aspects in which it comes through, um, make those changes, and be committed to a really long process. If you, if you are discriminate, if you can prove that you're discriminated against, and that we're equally qualified and everything else equal, and um, I make more money than Linda, then Linda could press charges. So in that sense, it is equal pay is mandated. Yeah, but, but the burden is on the individual employee. Uh -huh. That's yeah. what I'm saying. I, I also think we have to think about what we mean by equal pay. So I was at the White House a couple months ago on Equal Pay Day, and there was a large number of companies talking about their initiatives, and this very, very large company uh, said, you know, we've eliminated the pay gap um, in our company. Um, and everyone thought that was fabulous, of course. And, and I looked at the CEO and I said, really, how did you do that? What measures did you use? And he said, well, we have this regression and you put all these controls in for occupation and all that. And then there's no pay gap. There's no coefficient on gender. It's zero. I said, hmm, what if you looked at median salaries in your company for women and median salaries for men? Would those be equal? He said, well, of course not. I said, well, that's interesting, because actually I think that's the problem. And he said, well, we could never change that. And I just thought that was a really interesting, um, because we sort of defined the pay gap now in this overly controlled way. Of course, once you control for all these factors, maybe there won't be a pay gap. But we have differences in opportunity that leads to differences in education and experience, and those are significant contributors to the pay gap. So, I think we really need to evaluate how we're measuring this because that's going to inform how we make progress on it. I 
think on that note, um, I'm going to have to conclude, but I can tell you that we have a breakout session, and many of the discussions that we have now, we definitely will continue. Um, for example, on balanced evaluations, I see Kate is sitting right here, so Kate Glacebrook from uh, Behavioral Insights team is going to talk about her amazing technology instrument, uh, Applied, which is helping level the playing field for organizations. We'll also revisit the wage gap and talk more about uh, interventions on gender diversity and other diversities in teams. With that, thank you all very much, and thank you to the panelists. So thank you to the panelists. Um, if you could take your mics off and just drop them down there. Um, uh, I'll provide a very quick rundown on what's about to happen. Um, so these are a few introductions of the breakout sessions that we're about to go into. You'll hear from speakers representing each of the breakouts this morning, including Vera Miranova from the Harvard Kennedy School, Mike Norton from Harvard Business School, Jim Greiner from Harvard Law School, and Anuj Shah from the University of Chicago. Apologies for the Harvard heavy morning. Um, you've been assigned to a breakout session based on your preferences. Most of you will find this on the back of your name tag. Uh, please adhere to the assignments we gave you just for fire code purposes. Uh, we'll be filming every single breakout session, every session of this conference and making it available. We know you can't see every single amazing thing that's going to happen, but we're going to do our best. Um, please note that we're not leaving time for questions at the end of this session. There will be ample time during the breakout. Uh, once, once Anuj wraps up, uh, please follow the volunteers on hand to Aldridge Hall, which is very easy. It's just right across the way. We'll have break food there and beverage available. You can eat in there. You can take it back into Spangler. You can eat outside. And our breakout sessions are going to start very promptly at 11.15. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Vera. I couldn't hold both of them together. Do you want to stand? No. Does it work? It doesn't work. Whatever you want. Just no, either of them don't work. Can you hear me? It's on. Yeah. Does it work? I would just it should be quick. Does it forward? Like so. Okay. And back. Yep, everyone, thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, I'm Vera Miranova and I'm from Harvard Kennedy School. And we just heard about recruitment and human resources policies of organizations, right? Normal organizations that we see every day. I'm studying behavioral insight, how behavioral insights are employed in organizations, but my organization are a little bit different. They are armed groups and terrorist groups. So that's what I'm going to be talking briefly right now. So basically all my research is based, I'm doing right now research on Syria and it's based on interviews and surveys I conducted with armed groups of members on the front line in Aleppo and Idlib, including members of Al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda in Syria and ISIS foreign fighters. And also, you know, based on those interviews, we collected and uh, a data set with HR policies of each group. And you think your HR has problems? That HR has problems. <laughs> And they are not diversity that much because, you know, they're against it. <laughs> but they still have problems. Um, so, first of all, talking about recruitment. Why did people join the war? They joined for, I mean, we ask them, how would I know, right? Like, I ask them. Um, so people, uh, both Islamists and moderates, joined for grievance reasons, for emotional reasons, right? because they want to, you know, revenge, they want to defend their community, and so on. But it was just, just for us, you know, choosing a profession is just the first step. Then we need to find out what company we're going to be working for. Same there. You know, and we have, for example, you know, you know 20 big banks. They have more than 1,000 brigades. Like, that's a hard choice. So how did they choose a particular group to work with, uh, to work for? And conditional on it having the same goals as a fighter do, they looked at groups as institutions. I mean, they want medical insurance because it's not a question if something happens to you, it's when. So they want you know, the group to take care of their fighters and so on. So they're considering brigades based on what they could provide them. You know, bonuses, food, um, medical services, and so on. So basically we know that it's good for a group to provide all those things, right? Because then people come to you. But that's, that's not that good. 
Like here we basically say that on the other side, when we asked leaders about their particular group, they also confirmed that when they had all this stuff and they were able to provide fighters with training, something we value in civilian industry also, they had more people coming in. But when they had people coming in, when everyone wanted to join, what happens? They need to screen those people, right? It's nice when you have a line, but you couldn't take everyone. And you want to make sure you have the best. And in US, we, could, we have laws, we could fire people. They don't have this luxury of firing people in there. So they actually have to rely on a lot of behavioral signals to screen people. And the most popular brigade right now in Syria is Jabhat al-Nusra, which is Al-Qaeda branch in Syria. And, you know, it's harder to get there than to Harvard. <laughs> um, so, how do they screen people? First, they actually ask for recommendations, like we do. They ask for recommendations from leaders. Then they could actually follow you for two days at least. We know cases when they were following a person for two days who wanted to join because they wanted to make sure he's not a drug addict. So at least Harvard does not do that, right? Um, but even that is not enough because it checks your previous history. But not, you know, it could not screen you while you're already in the group. So that's exactly when they have to rely on very behavioral mechanism of proving it. And you know, that's where Islamism comes in. Because they, uh, through the, with the explanation of Islam, they are using additional costs. So for example, you want to be in my group? Great, but not that you're gonna just fight for me. You, I'm gonna make you do some other very weird things. So you prove to me that you really want to be in my particular group. And those things are very visible in nature because I need to be able to monitor you. So they are not like, Islam actually related, they're just very visible because I need, it's, it's monitoring purposes. So, for example, they were in the beginning of the war, you know, you remember you're watching TV and the people are dressed in this traditional Central Asian, you know, pajama looking like dress, which was not native to Syria. And actually Syrians consider it, you know, a little village. Uh, but now, you know, fighters have to wear that. And it's costly for them because it's not, it's not normal in a Syrian society. The same with long hair, which is considered extremely feminine. And, you know, that's, that's a very big accusation in the Middle East. But they made them wear long hair as a symbol of, you know, being in a group. Like behaviorally signaling that you want to be in this group. And, you know, not drinking alcohol, for example. Does the system work? Let's put it that way. It works better than the rest. But it has a very interesting problem, again, behavioral related. Those signals depreciate. You remember Mexican gangs and tattoos. At some point, where did tattoo come from? Mexican gangs were using them to show their membership in a gang. Now you're going outside, everyone has it. It's not a symbol of anything. So those symbols that Islamists use, they also depreciate. So now you go to the refugee camp and you have kids who want to you know, look like fighters, so they also wear all that. So the signal becomes less costly. Yes, what happens? They need to constantly invade, in, in, uh, they constantly figure out more signals. And it's hard to do. So right now, like last time I checked, we have new signals. It's overly Islamic words, like very, you know, the speech is hard to understand sometimes because they're putting, this, they're constructing those new Islamic words. Then uh, Al-Nusra prohibits smoking. You know, we're all behavioral here. We, we understand that it's like revolution. Like they have to quit smoking. To, like that's big. But it's a real signal right now because to be a member, you really need to do that hard thing. Plus, they even, right now, they even went that far as to make a signal of this thing you could see on the screen, which is a, which is a tooth cleaning twig. So it's a toothpick. But now people who want to signal like them being overly Islamists, they actually use it. Like they're constantly chewing it. And you could see how big and like weird the thing is. But because the signals depreciate every time they have to invent more. So from outside when you turn on TV, you know, right now it looks like series descending in like crazy apocalypses. But it's a side effect from those costs that are constantly depreciating and they have to come up with new ones. So that was a you know, brief introduction to my research. 
uh, that I'm gonna you know, present more during the breakout session. And also, I'm gonna be um, in this breakout session with other researchers. Um, who also do great work on recruitment and HR policies in more normal organizations. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. said, can I use this mic? And Linda said, you have to turn it on. So, so um, uh, my session is about um, philanthropy. I'm going to just tell you a little bit about the people uh, in the session um, with me. But I wanted to start. So like many of the topics uh, that are in the breakouts today, the research is interdisciplinary, which is uh, some of your academics, or you, at least you've interacted with academics, is pretty rare that different disciplines would ever like even think about talking to each other and certainly not collaborate together on anything ever because our way of viewing the world is correct and those people are idiots and they don't even understand the problem. Uh, philanthropy has been interesting because it started out that way and now I think there's more of a mix across disciplines. So um, my advisor in graduate school was a guy named John Darley. Well, if you don't know, you should. He's the guy who did the bystander intervention research uh, in the late 1960s. The more people who witness an emergency, the less likely the person is to get help, which is from any sort of calculation doesn't make any sense. But of course, he's a social psychologist, and he understood that what happens is everyone looks around and says, somebody should do something, and then nobody ever does anything, and then the person never gets uh, any help. It's interesting, that was one of the foundational studies in social psychology about what it means to help. And social psychologists were like, isn't it crazy that people don't help? That was like the starting point. Like, can you believe that somebody needs help and these idiots are just standing around and not helping anybody? And what's interesting is if you look at economics, the foundational paradigm in economics <laughs> is the dictator game. Does anyone know the dictator game? It's an awesome, amazing, amazing paradigm where you give somebody $10 and you say, give however much you want to this other person who you'll never meet again, you'll never see them again. And people give like three bucks. And economists were like, oh my god, why the hell would people give them any money at all? So you have these weird reference points in the two fields, actually. So psychology was like, why aren't people helping more? And economists were like, why do people help at all when it's not in their interest and there's no reason to do that? And for a while, it was like, well, those, again, those people have it wrong. But then you think about it, and both of them are incredibly important. And they lead you to different inferences about helping in general. And they also lead to very different interventions about how you could get people to help more. Because if your reference point is like, of course people want to help, but then the situation exerts pressure on them or there's social pressures and it inhibits them from helping, think of the interventions you would design to get people to help more compared to probably people don't want to help at all because there's no reason to help. How do we insert a motivation or add a motivation to do that so that they will start to help? And in some of the research that you'll hear about today too, these, you'll see these, um, two things at play, because I deliberately asked people from different disciplines uh, to be in uh, the session. Uh, I'm just going to say a little bit about what each person will talk about uh, in a second. But we have people um, from psychology, including myself, from marketing, from economics, from decision sciences uh, in the session. Charles Best from um, DonorsChoose.org will also uh, be in that session. You may have heard of them. The way we're going to do the session, uh, I made people do this. I said you can only have six slides. And I'm, that was basically, I looked at the slides, I got no one has six slides. But if you say six, they do like 12. <laughs> but, but they feel like bad about it. <laughs> so, that's, so we have like 12, 12 in, in each uh, session. Uh, I've told people to do your favorite finding that you kind of already worked on and uh, that has been published. Usually for most people, it's like the thing that they would be known for to the extent any of us are known for anything. Then I said present an ongoing project that you're working on right now. And I think most importantly, I said, um, pitch a new idea that, that you'd like to work on with an organization. So ideally in the session, what will happen is we'll spend very little time on what we've done, a little bit on what's happening right now, because that's usually what we're jazzed about. But most of our time actually saying, here's something I'd love to test. And ideally, then we could chat with folks and try to find a place to test 
uh, these ideas together. And I'll just briefly say um, what people are going to talk about. I noticed the theme. I realize now how weird that looks, <laughs> actually. Uh, I promise it will make sense in a moment. Charles is a very handsome man, so it would be the worst thing. So um, in a lot of the uh, talks, even though people come from such different backgrounds, there's a lot of um, sense of kind of this issue of impact in, in philanthropy and charitable giving in general but impact in really, really different ways and at different phases in the game. So um, Charles Best, who's from, so Donors Choose, if you don't know them, uh, amazing nonprofit where public school teachers in the US, uh, primarily from low-income school districts who don't have enough money to buy supplies for their students, often they buy them themselves out of their low salaries. Now you can go on DonorsChoose.org and buy them for the kids themselves. And it's like the kids, the teacher wants uh, to Mark Twain, you can go buy the kids Mark Twain. If they want a microscope, you can go buy them a microscope. The teacher writes you a thank you note. The kids write you, like in crayon, thank you notes. I have some in my office. I think it's the kids and not like the teacher faking it. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, it really is the kids. Amazing evidence of impact, actually, right? So when you give to a charity, what happens? Who knows? Now you have in your hand a note from the kid who actually benefited. A cool um, project that Charles is going to talk about, um, Donor Shoes uh, does lots of cool experiments and research is a uh, experiment where they had, thank you, is an experiment where they had, um, you got an email that said like, what, why don't you give this month? And you know, people give or they don't give. And one of them, they, um, they took your last name and they found a teacher somewhere, they have so many teachers on Donors Choose, that they found a teacher somewhere in the country with your last name. <laughs> so I actually got an email that said, Mike, I forget, the, I couldn't find the first name, but it was like, Mike, won't you help Mrs. Norton in Cleveland? Uh, in her classroom, and I was like, oh my god, of course, it's Mrs. Norton. <laughs> and they, they saw a huge rise, actually, in, in people giving. Now, it makes no sense, right, I don't care about Cleveland particularly, except it really gave me the feeling of connection and, and oddly of having an impact. Like, I'm helping this specific person, vaguely, they have my last name, I shouldn't really care about that, but I did, this idea of triggering people to think of who they're actually going to help. It's not just a teacher, it's someone with my last name, and that makes it more interesting. Um, Dean Carlin's going to talk about some research, but he's also going to talk about uh, an organization that he started called Impact Matters, which is almost like an auditing firm that tries to take organizations and nonprofits, particularly nonprofits, understand the impact that they're actually having on the cause they're trying to solve, not only try to measure that impact directly, make sure the nonprofit is measuring it well, and then report back to the rest of us like this nonprofit is actually having an impact on the world. And I think that's so important because there's a lot of websites now that evaluate charities, and many of them are, are great. I don't mean to criticize them. But there's very little on the what kind of impact are they actually having on the people or cause. And it's because there's been no measurement, in a sense. So Dean's trying to really think about the actual impact happening on the other end and see if that will change how people give. Um, my colleague here at HBS, Liz Keenan, is going to talk about um, some of her research. One of my favorite papers of hers is this idea of overhead aversion. When you give to a nonprofit, you have some vague awareness that some of the money is going to some stuff that's not the people that you want to help, and it really makes us mad. So how do you deal with that question of having too much overhead? Liz and her colleagues did a really cool experiment where they told people, um, we have an anonymous donor who um, covered all the, over all the overhead. Don't worry about it. And they compared that to an anonymous donor who, for example, matches your donation, which is really common. And they find, like matches often work, although not always, but they find that saying that the person covered the overhead, even though it's the same amount of money, massively changes how people give because you're like, all of my money now is going directly to the people who need it. It really gives you, again, this feeling of impact on, on another person and direct impact. My project uh, that I'll talk about briefly is this idea of voting for charity. We, ha we worked with a retailer who gives a lot of money to charity. We had people come into the store, and they were giving them a slip of paper that said, um, here's the charities we give to. And they wanted people to buy more stuff from the store because they were nice. And people were like, throw that on the ground. Who cares? We changed it very briefly, very simply. So slip of paper, same thing. But it said, vote for the charity you want to get the most money. And you have to hand it in at the cashier. So what people did was they voted, and then they held the piece of paper all the way through the store. And we find that they buy a little bit more stuff, not a crazy amount more in the store, but a little bit more stuff in the store because, again, they feel like the store is allowing them to have more of a specific impact. Um, Deb Small um, is going to talk about newer research as well, but her research on the identifiable victim, which many of you probably are aware of, this idea that it's better to give, shouldn't say better, we like to give more to one person than to a group of people. 
again, because we feel we have this specific impact. She's also going to talk about some research about how we care more about the effectiveness of uh, when we invest in things for for-profits than non-profits, which is interesting. So we're talking a lot about impact, impact. People don't necessarily care as much about impact for nonprofits because they have other sorts of goals. And then Ashley Willens, who's at the University of British Columbia, will talk about some cool research where um, they try to basically, it's the identifiable victim, it's almost like the identifiable donor. They basically say there are times in the world, I'm butchering this, but it's like there are times in the world when one person needs to step up. And you read that and you're like, it's me. And then you're more likely to give to charity. And it's particularly true of really wealthy people who are like, I don't need to do anything. But then you tell them you're the agent, and they're like, I can do it. And then they'll give uh, more money. So across these, they're going to talk about lots of other stuff as well. But I thought it was interesting that all these different disciplines in our own ways have landed on this issue of um, having more impact. And all of us will be um, saying more. Uh, and we'll hopefully have a discussion about some broader issues as well. I just wanted to flag those that are above specific people giving and more about the broader ecosystem of philanthropy uh, in general. Thank you. So my name is Jim Greiner, and I'll be uh, introducing the breakout session on law uh, and behavioralism. Um, I was trying to think of a theme for the speakers uh, that, that you'll be hearing at that breakout session. And I think I've decided that the theme is uh, attempting to remove law from its current status as the rear end of the behavioralism field. <laughs> so what do I mean by the rear end of the behavioralism field? Um, what I mean by that is that many people, and I think, it, uh, and I continue to think of this when I think of what law can contribute to behavioralism, uh, when we figured out what behavioralism uh, tells us about a particular subject, uh, we think we've found some causal mechanism or something like that. We think we can in some way fix it with law. We can pass a law and have it done. And so it's sort of, we've done the hard work and then we're just going to shove it. No, I don't, don't want to go there. But anyway, you get the idea that we can fix it at the back end with, uh, with a law or passing a law or passing something that, that is akin to a law or a policy uh, and that that will uh, fix it. And if we can just figure out how to structure that law properly, then we'll be done. And what I think you'll find if you come to this breakout session is that thinking uh, about law and, and as an independent uh, way of thinking about things, the same way you would think about something like economics or psychology, the way Mike just introduced these different paradigms, uh, that law has uh, paradigms of its own, and that can be good and that can be bad. It can have its same pathologies in terms of sticking people to particular ways of thinking. Uh, and in fact, one of the things you'll hear about are structural ways that we train lawyers that may stick people to those particular times of thinking so it's less of a culture than it is a cult. Uh, but it also can lead to different insights about ways of, about, uh, that can contribute to behavioralism. So uh, Netta barak Koren um, will talk about uh, how social psychologists have recently begun to map pathways to mitigate value conflicts, very, very difficult value conflicts. These mappings have led to insights about preemptive steps that policymakers can take to mitigate value conflicts before they turn into something really nasty. Uh, and she will discuss some of her own works on, on ways to mitigate those conflicts, focusing in particular on uh, religious beliefs, anti-discrimination laws, and science, and how those uh, various frameworks conflict with each other and how law can mitigate them. Yuval Feldman, uh, who researches, uh, who research, whose research broadly focuses on behavioral ethics, uh, meritocracy, anti-discrimination, and corruption, will discuss the, what he thinks is the neglected role, uh, neglected role of behavioral ethics in law and economics uh, and behavioralism, as well as, again, the recent absence of lawyers and legal scholars in behaviorally focused initiatives across the world. Uh, in particular, he will focus on how these issues can shed light on what he considers to be two puzzles, two central puzzles, uh, in, the, in the intersection of, of ethics and behavioralism. One is why people are so frequently unable to make the right decision, whatever it is that you consider, however you define rightness. And the second is why people are so infrequently able to recognize the moral decisions, the moral dimensions of the decisions that they make. Rosanna Summers, who you just heard uh, earlier ask an excellent question, will talk, who uh, studies uh, questions of cognition as they relate to consent, coercion, autonomy, and responsibility uh, in the law. She will examine how the law and the, and the public judges, evaluates ethically and morally our own behaviors and our own decisions. 
Her own research suggests that both law and human beings generally impute far too much intentionality, too much autonomy, too much responsibility, and too much consent to our own choices day to day that may be warranted by the surrounding circumstances. Rosanna will propose that a more psychological approach to understanding choices and behavior can lead to laws and uh, institutionalizations that are both more humane and more effective. Ryan Bubb, who researches regulatory policy, financial institutions, and business organizations primarily, will propose a behavioral theory of mandatory disclosure. He will discuss how behavioral science is poised to revolutionize this very old technique, this very old, especially in law, uh, mandatory disclosure technique and that the uh, behavioralism, bringing behavioralism to bear, can show how there are three different models for mandatory disclosure. One is simplification to make choices better informed. Second is nudging to be debiased choosers. And third is, is uh, uh, nudging to manipulate choice. And he will discuss the regulatory and behavioral implications for each of these different models. Oren, um, uh, Bar Gill, who is here at the uh, Harvard Law School, will discuss about uh, uh, law economics and the behavioralism of contracts and contracting, especially as relate to consumer protection, specifically the regulation of consumer contracts. He will characterize the consumer markets as a product of the interaction between market forces and consumer psychology. He will then address recent uh, legal policy initiatives and interventions in the space from disclosure mandates to bans and price caps in the new restatement of consumer contracts, which he is co-authoring. And then I will bring up the rear uh, in this session and, and discuss a question near and dear to my heart, which is uh, why I was able to achieve tenure at Harvard Law School by essentially doubling the number of randomized control trials evaluating legal interventions that had been done in the United States legal profession, doubling it, taking it from three to six. <laughs> Uh, I will begin by noting that in the mid-1930s, two foundational papers were published uh, using randomization to make important inferences of causation. Uh, one was in law and the other one was in medicine. Thus, in 1935, one would have been hard-pressed to guess which profession would transform itself into a science. Neither was a science at this time point. Uh, and which would evolve to afford the RCT as a, a central place in its professional epistemology. If we think that the fact that one of these professions evolved in, uh, in a way to essentially deny the RCT any role at all in its professional epistemology, if we think that is bad, and I do, then I will offer some speculation about why it might have happened and what we might do about it. So look forward to seeing you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're looking forward to being part of the conversations today. And in our panel, Anundi, Frank, Heather, and I are going to sort of take a step back to ask kind of a broad question, namely, how should we think about the lives of the poor? And that's kind of a big question, maybe a little bit too big for 90 minutes. So let me just set expectations up front and say uh, we're actually not solving poverty today in our panel. We wanted to, we were going to do that, but the organizers asked us to save that for BX 2017. So, so this is the prequel for that. Uh, in fact, we're not even the first ones to really ask this question, right? So as long as there have been the social sciences, social scientists have been interested in trying to understand the lives of the poor. And so there are lots of views, multifaceted views, trying to understand the lives of the poor, the challenges that poverty creates, and the disparities and the outcomes that we're trying to improve. So for example, we know that the poor deal with the number of outcomes or disparities. They often borrow too much at too high an in interest rate, or they save too little for the future. And that creates financial stress that spills over into lots of other domains in their lives. So there might be, uh, they might be less productive at work, more marital instability. They might have less time or attention to devote to their children, whether in terms of reading to their kids or speaking more words to their kids. There might be harsher or less consistent discipline in the home even see it spilling over into there being worse medical adherence, more missed appointments, and this list kind of just goes on and on and on. And so then we've got this long list of outcomes and we're trying to understand, okay, what is it about poverty that explains these outcomes? And of course, there are lots of explanations for this. So some people start with a very simple view, which is to say, well, maybe the poor are just somehow different individuals. Maybe they're less intelligent or less capable. 
So others will take a slightly broader view. They'll say maybe there's a whole culture of poverty. Maybe the poor subscribe to different cultural norms, and that's what drives these difference, differences in outcomes. Still others take an even broader view and say, well, we know that society is structured differently, or at least throws up different barriers or hurdles for the poor. They have less access to good financial services or good schools or political representation and so on. And the interesting thing about all of these theories that try to link poverty to these outcomes is that in a funny way, these aren't really theories about poverty, right? These are theories about the things that are correlated with poverty, and then these theories look at how those correlates might affect these outcomes. But in the course of doing that, it overlooks something kind of fundamental. It overlooks this question, which is, how does poverty itself directly drive these outcomes? And if you ask that question, you start with a very basic definition. What does it mean to be poor? Well, if you're poor, you lack money. And so then the question is, OK, how does lack of money drive these outcomes? And as plain and obvious as that question is, it's actually been kind of overlooked until the past few years. So there are a few startling results that come out of this line of work. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this one by Anandimani, Jiaying Zhao, Eldar Shafir, and Sandal Moyanathan, where they find that when you lack money, it impedes your cognitive function, that your ability to think through and solve the problems that you're facing is diminished. And so poverty creates this tax on our mental bandwidth. And so in an instant classic study that I'm sure you know, Anandimani looked at what happens to sugarcane farmers in their households before harvest when money is tight and after harvest when there's more cash on hand. And after harvest, the sugarcane farmers seem like a different person, namely a smarter person. Before harvest when money is tight, their cognitive function is lower. And so she'll update us on some of the other factors that affect mental bandwidth in the poor. And she might even give us a preview of some work that we've been doing with Give Directly, an organization that gives money directly to the rural poor in Kenya, and ways that that intervention, that cash transfer program, might actually build mental bandwidth for the poor. But I think one of the interesting things about this bandwidth perspective is that it pushes us to move past just thinking about the economic lives of the poor to instead think about the psychological lives of the poor as well. And so in my own work, I'll, which I'll mention a little bit about today, I'll talk about how the poor are often attuned to or pay attention to different features of the world, and that can actually lead to a certain brand of expertise and decision making among them. So behavioral science, the behavioral exchange, is all built on the notion that people are susceptible to framing and other kinds of biases, and I'll suggest that the poor might actually be less susceptible to some of these biases. But maybe the biggest contribution of this bandwidth perspective is that it actually shifts the kinds of outcomes that we might care about in the lives of the poor. So rather than the outcomes that we started with, we might think about a different set of outcomes, and this is work that Frank and Heather have been doing in the recent uh, past few years, where they say, well, other outcomes that matter a lot are the fact that the poor sleep less well. They have to endure fluctuations or shortages in nutrition and food. They're, in some communities, alcohol consumption might be higher. And in many communities, there's often more physical pain among the poor. And the interesting thing about these outcomes compared to some of the outcomes that we saw before is these aren't really just outcomes. These are also inputs. These things feed back into the mental lives or mental bandwidth. It's easy to imagine how if you're lacking sleep or if you're short on food, that that itself is going to be a distracting thing that taxes your bandwidth and makes it hard to solve the problems that are in front of you. And so that's the goal for today, which is to sort of step back and ask a rather simple question, which is how do the everyday experiences actually affect the mental lives of the poor? And we're looking forward to having that conversation with you all, and we hope to see you there. Thanks.